everybody. Good morning, everybody. We do this. We do this every year for those who are come to this, and you guys never get better at that. So, um, so I'd ask you to work on that. So, um, quick. Uh, the comms team hates that I bring. I always. This is my safety blanket. I always bring a coffee cup up here. They hate that I bring it up because it's not branded. So I cut out a sticker of CB Insights. Um, so the comms team, I listen to you. Um, so some quick sort of administrative things. Um, for those of you who have the program, on the back there's something that looks like this. It's called Passport. So what Passport lets you do is you kind of work through our product stations outside and you get to get some great swag. And so I'm going to show you some of the swag. And I want you to ooh or ah after I show them to you. All right, my favorite, well, first is this CB Insights banker bag. So if you're a wannabe investment banker, you can now have your own banker bag. Um, we have this Bluetooth umbrella. So if you ever lose your umbrella, there is an app that will help you find your umbrella. Um, CB, nobody's ooing or eyeing. Um, CB Insights sucks. Um, oh, and for any expectant parents, we have the Eat Drool Data onesie. Um, so uh, please get your passport completed and get some great stuff. Um, thank you for coming out. I uh, have a lot to cover. Uh, for those of you who've been here before, I actually have fewer slides than typical. I think I have. 101 and 28 and a half minutes to go. So we will get going. Uh, so a couple of other sort of logistical items. This is the first year that we are doing simultaneous translation. I'm very excited about this. So for those of you who have a headset, just so you know, Japanese is on channel one, Mandarin is on channel two, Spanish is on channel three. Uh, Wi-Fi, CB Insights, Future of FinTech. I hope it works. Um, so a little bit about the folks in the room. This is our most international audience ever. Uh, we have 54 countries represented. Uh, just by clapping, who, it, who came from outside the US to Future FinTech? <laughs> awesome. You know, thank you for, for making uh, the trek. Um, we also got a lot of feedback over time that you know, folks wanted more startups in the audience. So we made a big push this year to get more startups. And so we have a quarter of folks in this room are founders, CEOs of startups. Um, and we think the magic happens when you get those folks with big companies. And so we have a really great contingent of Fortune 100 companies as well. So incredibly international audience, uh, lots of startups, lots of big companies, and, and hopefully a lot of good things will happen. Um, the networking lounge, just some stats. And, and so just so you know, it's already fully booked, which we weren't expecting. So um, you can still schedule meetings. You just won't be able to use the networking lounge. But 75% of attendees are on it. Uh, somebody, as of two days ago, had 41 meetings. So they're probably not listening to this because they're meeting with somebody. Um, and the average engagements per attendee meeting conversations or meetings is nine. The most uh, kind of popular topics, digital banking partnerships, um, and payments. Um, thank you to a few folks. Uh, you know, uh, we have some sponsors and partners. I just want to say a quick thanks to Mattermost, Roostify, Zeta, and the FinTech Professionals Association. If you see folks from those organizations here, please, uh, please say thanks to them as well. Um, so today I'm going to cover two things underneath this umbrella of the future of information. So um, the first is kind of how enterprises manage information and manage work. This is a problem that we think a lot about. Um, our whole business is around this. Um, and then the second part is sort of how do you mobilize information to see the future. And I'm going to give you some predictions that we are, are making about where we, think, where we see things going in financial services. Um, on the first part, um, so last night at Tavern on the Green, somebody came up to me and said, hey, I just learned CB Insights has 250 people. Um, how do you have 250 people when all you do is a newsletter? Um, <laughs> Uh, and, 
<laughs> struck me that people don't really know, I guess, what the hell we do. So, uh, so you know, first part, uh, this is a great opportunity for us. We have hundreds of our clients in the audience. I uh, want to tell you a little bit about, in the first part, some of the stuff we're working on, and then we'll get into some predictions um, after that. So let's kind of get into the managing work or managing information part of things. So uh, this is what we're kind of known for, lots of data around market sizings or patents or research. Um, when we work with our clients, you know, a lot of it is well, how do they, we try to understand how they manage work, right? And we work with a lot of different teams within these large enterprises. We're definitely sort of a, you know, enterprise focused firm. And so, you know, you can see kind of some of the folks that we tend to work with all here. And the way they work is in this very state of the art way. Most of you who are here will understand that you have this amazing system that you use to do your work. And that system looks like this. Um, right, so this is basically, as for you know, a lot of our clients, this is uh, this is sort of real time knowledge capture, and then you get an email like this, and that ruins some poor analyst day because now they have to go and track down all this information. Um, and when we look at sort of how other folks work, you know, your sales team has Salesforce, your HR team has Workday your marketing team has Marketo, and you have an Excel spreadsheet, or maybe you have SharePoint where files go to die, you have Salesforce, you have lots of emails, right? So this is sort of not working, and it's something that we've been thinking a lot about. Um, and so a great example, actually yesterday we do a, a sort of executive forum and somebody was talking about this. They had this sort of startup they were working with that engaged with their partnerships in biz dev group. And then that same startup started working with one of their biz dev groups in a business unit. And then they started working with their tech scouting group and so on. And you see, they ended up working with eight different groups. And the only way that those groups knew about it was because the startup told them. Right? So this is sort of the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing in lots of these large enterprises. Um, and so what ends up happening is this sort of repetitive diligence, this collective knowledge that isn't captured and it's expensive. So something we've been thinking a lot about. Uh, and so you know, all these connections between these systems are, are clearly broken. Um, you know, and when we think about what, what we think folks want is sort of you know, flexible, Decrease time to mastery. Over the course of the next couple of days, you're going to hear about reg tech, financial inclusion, robo advisors, payments, you know, a whole variety of things that are difficult to get your head around quickly. Uh, you know, people want increased velocity on the work they do, and then they want that data to sync. So, something coming out this summer uh, that we're launching called Collections, uh, trying to get you to, you know, whether the work you're doing is proactive, reactive, or you need to illustrate something, help you do that. So, kind of just walk you through it again for clients in the room uh, you know would love to chat more on this so uh, you know you just heard from Max you know you, uh, as when this launches you go on our mobile app you basically kind of plug in a firm um, add it to your collection you'll now kind of be able to tag things t say what business units you want to engage with put it in your funnel assign it to somebody kind of leave her a note and you know start that process and then again this all syncs across everything we do, so both web and mobile. Um, again, if you're on the web, all of our data, is, so it doesn't show up empty. You can all do this. Just click of a button and you pull in all this information. And then again, it works with your workflow. So uh, your tags, you know, where things are in the funnel. And then this idea of, you know, hey, a firm is now working with multiple business units and all of that is now in one place. Um, and then where are things in the funnel? So you had, to, you know, what do you have in first look? What do you have in legal review? What do you have in sort of pilot proof of concept, so all in one place. So that's when you're sort of proactively doing work, those of you who are here sort of doing that. And then you get the reactive, right, which is the boss sends an email saying, hey, I heard fictitious Bank of USA just committed a billion dollars to this. Now, how do you do that? Um, you know, you go in and search and find companies, but I think the other sort of big thing from a mastery perspective is going to be some of the work that our analysts do. Um, and so what you'll be able to do is add your own companies, but then be able to look at all of these things that are happening in financial services, and you can see, you know, we have many of them that we've built out for you. So, you know, for you to quickly get up to speed on what's going on, and then just copy the work of our team and basically get your organization ready to, and understanding of what's going on in this case in AI and fintech. So, big thing that we're sort of trying to sync all the data that we have with the data you have. Um, 
And then, you know, hey, I want to know what Goldman's doing, quickly filter, and then have a view into what uh, all your competitors are doing. So you see all of that now here in one place. So final piece, uh, and then we'll get to the predictions, is the illustrative side, right? So uh, everything ends up in a deck, right? PowerPoint is still the communication method of, of most large organizations, right? So how do you, now you can programmatically build a lot of those market landscapes. You can build that deck with the press of a button. You just press a button, this is what you get. Uh, you know, all the companies, the funding trends. Um, and I think the one big thing that I'm really excited about is something we call smart narrative. So we've, our research team has built lots of, uh, you know, blog posts and briefs and reports over time. Our machine learning team actually sort of trained up a model to build a narrative off of the work they'd done. So now instead of you having to interpret graphs, we can do that for you and it'll be just here in the deck. So. Uh, you know, kept all of these things in mind. I'm excited to launch this in a couple months and, and excited to sort of unveil it today. Um, you know, I think the big thing here is that uh, there's a study by IDC that found that two and a half hours of every day is spent by people either collecting information or recreating institutional knowledge. So in a team of three, what that means is you are flushing uh, one person down the toilet, right? So this is not... Uh, a very productive use of, of people's time. Um, and so I'll leave you with this sort of Warren Buffett quote, you know, should you find yourself in a chronically leaking boat, energy devoted to changing vessels is likely to be more productive than energy devoted to patching leaks. So hopefully, uh, you know, for those of your clients, we can get you on board with this and, and, and talk more about it. Um, now I want to talk about sort of how do you use information to see the future. Um, We've done this, I think, pretty well. This is the whole ethos of the company, right? Which is how do you use data to make predictions about technology, about markets, about uh, competition, right? So this was a post we did a while ago on Facebook's digital currency. Uh, patents, obviously now lots going on with, with Facebook. Another recent example, Morgan Stanley acquired a company called Solium, uh, a software to help manage uh, private company shares. You know, if you actually look for the clues prior You'd have seen, uh, you know, Morgan Stanley had done a number of deals with Solium prior. So I think that's another sort of great example of how you can follow breadcrumbs to make predictions. Um, and then the final one, sort of, uh, I think the thing that the team is, uh, th did a lot of great work around is with the New York Times, we'd predicted 50 future unicorns in 2015, and uh, 24 out of 50 ended up hitting that mark, right? So uh, I don't think there is a, uh, an investment firm that would have that type of, uh, of hit rate. So again, just examples of how we've used data in the past. So now I want to talk through some of the examples of what we see going forward. Uh, prediction number one, so banking's next battle will be for the paycheck, right? And so um, what we're seeing here is this is ADP. Um, ADP launched something called Wisely Direct. So it's a reloadable debit card that employers can offer to employees. Um, and what it does is it also comes with an app that helps you understand budgeting and savings and financial planning and things of that sort. So, um, you know, we, we sort of saw this and then if you kind of follow the breadcrumbs, you see lots of hiring activity by ADP and talk of them expanding into other consumer financial products. Um, you know, on LinkedIn, folks are talking about this being ADP's, you know, from, the, from ADP talking about this being their first consumer initiative um, and, and a billion dollar opportunity for them. Uh, Gusto and other payroll providers also thinking about launching a modern bank. Uh, and then we sort of have the unbundling of the paycheck, right? There's a lot now happening at the paycheck, right? Right at the point where you get paid are there payday advances, earned income advances, et cetera, that, that companies can offer. Uh, and so we see this as one of the big next battlegrounds for financial services is going even further and getting closer to the paycheck. Um, next thing, iBuyers, next markets. How many? Are you familiar with iBuyers? Yes, generally. So iBuyers are these companies that uh, use algorithms to purchase your home sight unseen, right? So from a home seller's perspective, it's incredible convenience, right? So I've been trying to understand, okay, where are they going next? So again, by mining information, here are some of the players in that space. So Redfin and Zillow, you may be more familiar with, but Opendoor, Offerpad, et cetera. Here are the markets that they're in within the states today. Uh, there's a, you know, a few popular ones, Phoenix and Dallas being amongst them. Uh, when you mine sort of some of the 
you know, what I'd call sort of open source information out there, you can see where they're going next, right? So uh, Atlanta is, is one particular market that there's a lot of interest in. Uh, and so these are where some of these players are going next. Um, prediction number three, we'll call it STAS, Stock Trading as a Service, right? So you're going to hear over the course of the next couple of days a decent amount what we call banking as a service, but this is sort of a more nascent trend that we think is picking up steam. There's obviously lots of chatter about Robinhood and kind of, you know, all the great work it's doing in terms of from a customer acquisition perspective and how that rivals uh, some of the incumbent trading platforms. Uh, what's sort of happening, I think, behind the scenes is this sort of API layer that's being built for wealth management and stock trading apps. So Quovo acquired, or was acquired by Plaid earlier this year for 200 million. And then there's a number of other companies that are working to build um, applications, you know, APIs that help simplify wealth and trading apps. So expect a lot more here. Um, uh, another one, uh, we mine lots of earnings transcripts. So I think what we're seeing now is that the street is going to start asking public company executives a lot more about private company challengers. Part of the reason for that is that there are lots of these challengers now who are quite large and who are not public, right? And if you've read the comments from the likes of TransferWise, which is one of these unicorns, they have no plans of going public, right? Uh, there was a great... Uh, uh, a great deck that I think uh, The Guardian found about Banco Santander, I think talking about the risk that a company like TransferWise poses to uh, parts of its business. So there are all these insurgents out there that they're a lot more opaque, but the street is wising up to them and you see it on earnings calls now. So this was an example of a small regional bank, Seacoast, being asked about Square. Uh, we can see Sally May, I know there's some folks from Sally May in the audience being asked about SoFi on earnings calls. Uh, Credit Karma uh, coming up on Intuit's calls, and then E-Trade uh, being asked about Robinhood and Coinbase. So the competitive lens through which I think public company executives are going to have to start looking at the world is, is starting to expand to include lots of these private companies as well, and we expect more of these types of questions coming in the, in the near future. Um, rent is the new mortgage, right? And so, uh, you know, let's just explain what this means, right? So there's kind of a well-documented trend about home ownership rates declining, especially amongst young adults, which you see here. The other interesting thing is that, that rent, uh, there's an increasing number of folks who are uh, considered cost burdened by rent, which means uh, the definition of that is that more than 30% of their income is going to rent, right? And so cost burden means that as a result of that high proportion of money going to rent, they're not able to spend on other sort of essentials like medical care or clothing or food. So there's a high degree of sort of cost burdened folks out there who are renting. Um, and so what we're seeing now is a number of companies coming to the fore who are trying to actually finance people's rent, right, or help them rent uh, with a view towards building towards home ownership. So again, a bit of a nascent trend, but again, one that we expect a lot more, uh, expect to see a lot more innovation coming through in, in the coming year. Um, and financial investing in Grab, uh, you know, it's, this is a, a timeline of Ant's investments in various digital wallet companies over time. So they've taken investments and partnered with companies uh, pretty aggressively. Um, their sort of chief rival, Tencent, has invested in GoPay. Um, and SoftBank and, uh, and Ant, which is the, the parent, or Alibaba, which is the parent of Ant, have a, a tight relationship. So we expect, you know, there's a lot of sort of connections between the two. Um, we're hearing Southeast Asia come up a great deal more on Alibaba's um, earnings calls as well. Um, and Grab, to some degree, has been following the playbook of, uh, of what Ant Financial has done. So, uh, you know, we think there's a, it makes a lot of sense for, for these two to sort of uh, kind of uh, tie up together. Um, India will be the hottest fintech market in the coming years. Um, you know, I think part of this is driven by, you know, India is right now uh, kind of the, the, the forecasts are that it'll be the largest economy in the world by 2030. And so what's interesting is the large tech players in China as well as the big players in the U.S. are both sort of going for it. So, um, you know, 
I wouldn't want to call this a trend based on just this graph, right? And Q1 of 19 was the first time, mostly because of a bad quarter for China, that India took over uh, from, a, from a funding perspective. But there's a bunch of other things going on. There's a thing in India called the Unified Payments Interface, which is an interbank kind of payment network. And you can see the growth of that here. And now what the regulators in India are doing is basically thinking about enforcing sort of QR codes uh, at shops in India to help cut down on, on fraud and, and some corrupt and, and some kind of, you know, uh, number two money, as I guess it's called. Um, uh, and so we expect a big explosion of sort of digital payments in India. Um, I mentioned kind of the China players investing a lot in India, uh, Paytm being the biggest recipient. Uh, and then, you know, Amazon, Google, MasterCard also making lots of bets in India, putting lots of resources into the Indian, uh, into the Indian market. And here are some of the kind of uh, uh, rumored large financings that are going into India. So we expect India to kind of be the number one sort of global market uh, in terms of growth for fintech investment in the coming years. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, this one I think is very counter to what is going on in the world right now. So when you look at deposit growth, um, the story has been exactly the opposite of our prediction that we just that we just put up on the earlier screen. You know, banks with greater than 50 billion in deposits have been the recipients and the winners of the deposit war. Um, the things that we think are going to change that is banking as a service, right? This ability to create and build um, banking applications will help. Smaller banks will help with insurgent companies kind of have product parity and innovate quicker. Um, and so what we're seeing actually is small banks are already partnering a great deal with fintechs, right? And so we work with a number of regional banks and you know, I'd say a few years ago, their biggest kind of common response to, hey, why don't you have this in your product portfolio was, well, we don't have the resources of a Bank of America um, uh, or a Citibank. Uh, you know, now I think through, through lots of these sort of API driven offerings, they're able to add lots of, uh, lots of these capabilities. Um, the other thing is then, besides the small banks, there's all these new digital banking products. And you can see in 2018, the number of new digital banking products by, insurg by insurgents that were launched. Um, finally, you can see kind of of the insurgents, how many of them are adding uh, new products, right? And so debit cards is obviously clearly one of the vectors that a lot of them are investing in. Um, you know, I think the other thing here is that it's not just the banks and sort of the insurgent fintech companies, but, you know, can we expect sort of the bank of Uber, right? And so just two days ago, Uber sort of announced they're making this big push into, into New York. The thing that this also highlights is that any sort of platform with a large, active, engaged user base could launch uh, products, right? So, you know, is, is Twitch going to launch a bank? Is Chewy going to launch a bank? Um, or I, I think my favorite would be like the Bank of Hove or the Bank of the Queen Bee. Um, you know, so anybody who has an, an audience essentially, you know, and you see this in e commerce, right? There's a lot of these, uh, the influencers who are launching these e commerce brands because they have these audiences. You know, is it conceivable that? Um, celebrities start launching their own hyper niche banking products. So expect a lot of these trends to put pressure on the big banks um, as a result. Um, and final kind of prediction here, uh, Goldman making a big move in mortgages. So Goldman's been kind of sniffing around sort of the, the home market for a bit. You know, they launched home improvement loans recently. Uh, uh, they launched a home renovation calculator to say, hey, what are you thinking of adding? And uh, you know, here's how much value that might add to the value of your property. Um, they've invested in a couple of companies, Trussell in the UK, Better.com here in the US that are, are mortgage companies. Um, and the big thing here is that uh, you know, last year, Mo Goldman actually talked about some of the, the financial products that they might be offering in the save, spend, borrow, uh, and protect sort of category. Of all of these things here, um, the dark blue are the ones that they're not in at present. The, the one that they've made the most moves in is mortgages. So expect that Goldman's going to make, make some bigger moves in the mortgage space. So you know, these are sort of non-traditional signals of sorts that we, we use to try to come up with, um, to come up with these predictions. I, I want to close with you know, w w a lot of what I study is sort of what uh, the intelligence community does. They have something they call open source intelligence, right? And law enforcement as well. And I want to close with, uh, with a, a couple of, a few points. Um, one is, um, how many people, anybody know who this guy is? 
Yeah, so this is, uh, for those unfamiliar, uh, this is a, a man named David Berkowitz. So this is in August 1977. Uh, this is him being apprehended by the police um, for uh, an entire year in New York City. From the summer of 1976 to the summer of 1977, uh, he terrorized New York City. It was the, still is the largest manhunt that's ever been, that's ever happened in New York City for, for a person. Um, and uh, you know, over that time, he, he killed six people, he uh, injured uh, seven others. And uh, you know, what was interesting is sort of all the dogma that, you know, that sort of gets passed down in every industry uh, you know, it was the same in sort of law enforcement at the time. They had tons of people, eyewitnesses, who came in and were giving kind of sketches, and all of those were colossally wrong, so they were just sending people in the wrong direction. He was actually sending letters to the police taunting them. Um, so they had lots of kind of clues. They had what they thought the patterns of a serial killer were, and he just didn't match any of those patterns, so none of that work uh, was effective. And what actually ended up taking down was sort of some un you know, some, some unusual data. Um, and so in uh, July 31st was, was when he committed his last, uh, his last crime. And um, somebody who they talked to said, hey, the night of, uh, I saw somebody giving out parking tickets, right? And so what they did was uh, they went and said, okay, let me go find everybody who, uh, who got a ticket that night. Presumably, if you're there to commit murder, you're not worried about um, feeding the meter. And so, um, and so what they found was all these people who got tickets, every single one of them had a car registered in Bensonhurst with the exception of one, which was registered at 35 Pine Street in Yonkers, uh, which is a, a suburb of New York City north of the Bronx. And, and that, was, um, that was the address of, uh, of the son of Sam, as he's known. So you know, I think using these non-traditional signals is, you know, in the intelligence community, especially if you've read about uh, the Silk Road, not the the old Silk Road, the new one with, that sold drugs, um, uh, you know, they basically pieced together all of this by using all this sort of open source intelligence. And so there's a lot of sort of wisdom out there. So that was point one. Point two, I got a lot of flack for this last year. I think I said that blockchain was a buzzword looking for a problem. Um, uh, I still stand by that. I feel, I feel vindicated, actually. Um, so, uh, so this is a, a look at earnings calls over time. And blockchain is now less than big data. So how far we have fallen. Um, um, you know, it's company descriptions, it's earnings calls, it's media, uh, a bunch of other things. So, uh, so uh, you know, that's where blockchain is. Final point, uh, I just wanted to say thank you. My, I was talking to my daughter a couple of days ago, and she said, hey, Daddy, do you get nervous when you go on stage? I said, I absolutely do. Uh, you know, uh, you, you all are giving us your, your sort of that the most valuable sort of unrenewable resource you have, which is your time. Uh, and I'm incredibly appreciative of that. The team is as well. So if there's anything we can do over the next couple of days to make this a better event for you, please find me, please find others on the team. Uh, but with that, thank you so much for coming and, and on to a great two days. Thank you.